Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. Today we're going to talk about a few different aspects of the photography industry. The first one is an article I read on uh, the website for 13 WHAM, W-H-A-M, which is the local ABC affiliate in Rochester, New York. They're reporting that uh, Kodak on Tuesday reported a loss of $111 million in its first quarter for 2020. Um, basically, they're going on to report that the revenue for the quarter was 267 million, which is a decrease of 24 million from the 2019 equivalent period. And most likely that's because, um, according to the uh, executive chairman, Jim Conanten Conantenza, um, basically it looks like they're re retooling their manufacturing to make isopropyl alcohol for disinfectants and using their Estar film base to make face masks. So um, rather than making film, they're making me medical supplies, which is uh, not unexpected in times like these. A lot of companies have risen to the occasion to um, make medical supplies that they can manufacture for use in fighting this virus. So, second article I want to bring your attention to today is from The Guardian, and it's, uh, now both of these are linked in the article, and as well as this article, there are two links to two of the photographers, uh, one's Instagram and one's website, who are in this article. This is 20 Photographs of the Week, and it's from... Uh, this past Saturday and the two uh, the photographs are amazing the Guardian has absolutely fantastic photo editors they just have this really wonderful eye for good images there's a great and diverse range in here if you're looking for a way to get high quality curated photos then the Guardian's photo posts like this are a really good way to find those high quality images the um, the two in here that really absolutely there every one of these is better than any photo I'm going to take this year, but the two that really blew my mind were pretty far down in the article. Uh, the first one is did I pass it? Thought I no okay. The first one is by a photographer in uh, Nice, France. It's the second one chronologically, but it's the first one to call out. The art, uh, photographer's name is Valerie Haish, and it's a photo of a woman on the beach looking out at the horizon. Very wonderful minimalist structure. And if you ever check, if you, there's a link to Valerie's Instagram, um, to Mr. Haish's Instagram. If you check out his work, he has a lot of really good minimalist work, and a lot of his work is focused on horizontal lines across the frame. Not all of it, but some of his most striking work has these very bold and strong horizontal lines. Um, really, he has a wonderful artistic eye. Then uh, up a little bit in that article, and the second link is to a photographer named Alan Murphy. It's to his website. He is, well, let's just say this. If you know of a better bird photographer anywhere in the world than Alan Murphy, let me know because I don't. So to the best of my knowledge, he's very possibly, if not certainly, the best bird photographer in the world. And it's a picture of a bald eagle in Alaska that is literally just got the splash and the fish in its feet. It's an, the composition in this. This is an amazing shot. Like it's with, with the Valerie uh, Hayes shot, you can plan that. You can say, here's where I want to stand. Here's what I want for the weather. I can, you can kind of get the colors based on what's available. Hire a model, have them stand out there and you can create that image. This is hours and hours and hours of patience waiting to be in the right place at the right time, repeatedly not being in the right place at the right time. Um, 
this kind of image is the sort of thing that if you take once in a lifetime, and he's taken more than one of this caliber of image, um, but even once in a lifetime, it'd be an amazing experience to take a photo like that. So, so there are links to both of those articles and then those, those two photographers, um, one's website and one's Instagram, for you to look at very interesting, uh, the Guardian photos are very interesting and wonderful. I apologize for this break in continuity. I, uh, I dropped my mic yesterday filming this segment and the clip broke, so I had to glue it up overnight. So before we get into the economics of making money in photography, a few things I just want to say up front. First is, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax attorney. If you are going into making money in photography, talk to a tax guy, talk to a tax attorney first. Hi, pup. Oh, yes, I'm back. You're a good boy. So nothing I'm going to tell you is that you should do this. I'm going to give you some tools to figure out if it's for you and if you decide to how to go about it. Make sure that if you get into this business, especially if you work for yourself, that you are keeping good financial records and that you're keeping track of how much you make and how much you spend so that come tax time, you can pay your taxes accurately. I'm really lucky. I have a very good tax guy who owns retail. And so when we started working together, he had made sure that, and I was pretty good about the documentation anyway, but he made sure I had everything that I needed for him to report accurately. And uh, that was a huge help. So if you do get into this, see if you can find a tax guy who has experience working with other small business owners and knows the ins and outs of that portion of the tax code in whatever country you're in. What? What? I know. You'd never get any attention. No one loves you at all, do they, Steinbeck? No, they don't. I know. Okay. So all of that said, let's talk a little bit about the process of making money. And in order to make money, you've got to sell a thing. What do I mean by a thing? There are two different things you can sell in the world, a good and a service. A good would be like this pen. A service would be like this video. A good is something you can touch and a service is something that you perform, right? So a service would be the act of taking photography. A good would be the tools to take those photos or printed versions of the photos that you take. So it's also possible if you're taking photos as a service that you could also sell a good, which is your printed work. In photography, there are lots and lots of ways to make money. The one that we are not going to talk about in any kind of detail is stock photography, because that's the area of photography where I've been least successful. And, uh, I am not the person you want to talk to about how to do stock photography because it's just not something I can seem to get the knack of. What we're going to do is talk about selling services as a photographer. And we're going to talk about selling goods as a photographer. If you're in high school or college in photography classes thinking that this is the life you want for yourself, it's very rewarding to work for yourself. It's also very hard and very long hours. I would never discourage you from doing that. What I would say is double major in business, or if you just don't have the time for that, try to minor, or if that's too much, at least take some business classes. Learn how the business side of the business works before you get into it in some theoretical way, so that when you start doing this, you have, bless you, so that when you start doing this, you have the tools needed to understand how the money works, where you're making money, where you're losing money, and where to stop the bleeding if you're losing money in lots of places. I know we've established you never get any attention whatsoever, do you? No, you don't. It's okay. Nobody loves you, Steinbeck. No, they don't. Of course, you're very much loved. You're a good boy. The tools I'm going to give you are tools you can use to figure out how much money you're making and how much money you or how much work you need to do to make a certain amount of money, okay? 
I'm going to continually use the figure $100,000 as a baseline, not because this is... Goodness. Not because a hundred... Not because $100,000 is the target that you should shoot for, or 100000 of whatever your, your country's currency is, but because it's easy for math. So I'll be using $100,000 because if you want to shoot for half that, all you have to do is cut everything that I show you in half. If you want to shoot for twice that, you just have to double it. If you want to shoot for one third of that, it's a little bit harder, but just go for 33% of what I show you, okay? So, so that's the reason that I'm gonna choose that figure. And everything here is just gonna be formulas that you can use, they're basic. You'll probably want to expand on them for your own work to figure out how much money you're making or losing. Okay, Steinbeck, you're such a cute pup. Even if you did sneeze on my pants and now they're all gross. All right. So let me, Steinbeck, I need you to, you are the worst co-star ever. <laughs> the cutest, but the worst. Uh-oh. Okay. So the first thing is, let's say that you're a working photographer and you are going to sell a type of photography. Could be weddings, pet photography, corporate photos, events, parties, portraits, fashion, whatever you enjoy shooting and can sell. That's what this is gonna help you calculate. This assumes that you, are, you have a client who is paying you and that you're not going out taking photos at risk to sell later. That's more like stock photography. So, so that sort of thing, if you're a wildlife or landscape or cityscape photographer going out taking photos with the aim of potentially selling them multiple times to different people. That's a different formula. Again, we're not gonna talk about that in this, this video. But let's say that you're working with a client who said, I'm going to give you this number of dollars for you to do these types of photographs for me, okay? So what you wanna do before you start negotiating with clients, uh, the best thing you can do for yourself going into this, if you're starting out, is have experience working retail and customer service because the majority of what you're gonna do as a photographer is not taking photos, it's not editing photos, it's interacting with and making customers happy. That is your primary job as a working photographer. And if you let your ego get in the way, if you have an ego at all dealing with customers, that's going to hurt you professionally. If you're not reliable, if you're a pain in the butt, those things will hurt you professionally. So what you wanna do is be uh, amenable to customers. Don't let them just totally mop the floor with you. You have to have boundaries, but you also have to be nice about enforcing those. And um, be willing to accommodate them. That doesn't mean take text messages from them at 2 a.m. You can have set working hours, but get back in a response uh, in a reasonable amount of time, be professional in your communications with them and so on and so forth. So basically, if you've ever worked retail, the lessons you learn working retail will help you in photography. So let's talk about some of the money side of it because we can do this with some formulas. The first thing you wanna do is figure out how good you are compared to your local competition. Photography is the consummate local industry. If you live in San Francisco, you're not likely to compete with New York photographers. You're not likely to compete with San Bruno photographers. Uh, you're likely to compete with other San Francisco photographers. Markets are very regional. You could live in the Bay Area and shoot in East Bay, but most likely East Bay is gonna be photographed by East Bay photographers. So you're gonna have a smaller area where you're gonna work in general. So look at other photographers in your geographic footprint. Look at their portfolios, see what they're doing and where you think you stack up. Odds are you're not the best. So if you think you are, it's probably time to dial back your own feelings about your work. Then once you have an idea of where you stand, 
look at how much they're pricing. Come up with a range. Who's the cheapest? Who's the most expensive? If you are in the middle of the pack quality-wise, then you're probably in the middle of the pack price-wise, or slightly lower if you want to give your customers a really good bang for the buck and bring in more revenue. There is an, an adage in sales, which is very true because as a working photographer, you're selling your photography. 100% of something is better than 100% of nothing. So if you take a little bit less money, yes, it's a little bit less money, but it's still money. And if the alternative is sitting at home twiddling your thumbs or playing Grand Theft Auto all day instead, it's better to make the money. All right, so for easy math, let's say that you are a photographer who does a certain type of photography and charges $1,000 a shoot, okay? So we've got 1,000 bucks a shoot to start with. Now we're gonna look at how this money erodes, where it all goes to eat up your time. There are gonna be costs that are not accounted as line items in here, such as your camera equipment, your computer equipment, things like that. What you could do is you can just say, this is an expense. I'm gonna amortize it over time and per shoot. We're gonna have a line item to catch a lot of these different things. The most important thing is figuring out how much you need to work to make a certain amount of money. So let's say that you're charging a thousand bucks per shoot and you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. You've got to do a shoot every three days. You've got to do a hundred shoots a year. There's 365 days a year. So basically every three days for the first 11 months and then take December off. Oops, sorry, pupper. That's a pretty assertive schedule. So, uh, now let's break this down into how much you're working. If you're charging a thousand bucks for a wedding, that could be a full day. There's only going to be 50 of those in a year though, because most of them are on Saturdays. If you're charging a thousand bucks for a half day portrait or pet shoot, something like that, that's significantly better. Um, so to earn this thousand dollars, if you work a full day, let's say, let's call that eight hours. Let's say you show up for an eight hour photo shoot just for easy math. It's 125 bucks an hour. So 125 bucks an hour is a really good living. If you can do that 40 hours a week, that's a $250,000 a year job. So, but if, um, this 125 bucks an hour is gonna erode really quickly. If that eight hours is for taking photos, it does not include editing, it doesn't include marketing, things like that. So if you work four hours for that thousand dollars, you still have to edit and market yourself, okay? So now you're going to have, we're at eight hours for the photo shoot. Now, if you add in Let's say that you're going to spend half of that doing editing. Your photos are really good. They don't need a whole lot. Basically, you're going to go in and you can, you can batch edit things and do minimal touch up on individual uh, photos four hours. If you have to do a lot of touch up, let's say that you're photographing someone and they have a lot of flyaways in their hair, you have to mask out or Photoshop uh, or clone out each one of those flyaways on five or 10 photos, you could spend an entire day doing just those photos. It's gonna get old fast. But let's say that, um, and it's gonna cut into your income fast. But let's say you spend four hours on average editing for a photo shoot, okay? So now we're at 12 hours for that photo shoot, which brings us down to 80 bucks an hour, right? So eight hours for the shoot, four hours for the edit, 80 bucks an hour but there's more than that. You're going to have to do some marketing. Every single photo shoot you do is going to require you to do some marketing, especially early in your career. So whether that's posting ads on Craigslist, going up to uh, uh, one of the search engines and buying ad space for keyword searches, developing ads that can run in front of YouTube videos uh, in your area, things like that. You're gonna have to create the ad content you're gonna to have to find the marketing venue for them and you have to post them and track how they're performing so that they're effective. 
So let's assume that that's something you just spend a day a week doing and that that's going to average out to about two hours per job over the course of the year. So if you get 100, photo sh 100 jobs over the course of a year, you're looking at spending about 200 hours marketing to get those. And that's, that would actually be a pretty successful marketing campaign. But if we're now down to 12, 14, 1,000 divided by 14, that's 60-ish dollars an hour. So if we include marketing now, you're down to about 60 bucks an hour. So, okay, not every ad is going to deliver a client. Not every client who contacts you is going to turn into a shoot. Not every client who you work for is going to pay quickly or on time or in full. So you're going to have to spend time talking with clients, evaluating whether you want to work with them. If a client reaches out to you, they're not just interviewing you. You are also interviewing them to see if you want to work with them. You have to evaluate them. Decide if you want to work with them. Okay? And that could easily be another two to four hours per job that you get. Could even be more. We're going to call it four on average because some clients will call you up or text you or whatever and you'll know right away you want to work with them or you won't. But um, in fact, many of them that will be the case, but you're not going to be, you're not going to have 100% of, of client contacts turning into quick decisions or jobs. So if you have 10 people contact you and one or two turn into jobs, the time you spent on those other eight or nine counts into this average number. So let's, what did I say we were going to call that four hours? Let's call it four, four more hours per job. So that's 8, 12, 16, 20. Uh, so we're down to $50 an hour. Okay. So we've got editing, editing, marketing, client communications. So this $1,000 photo shoot can very quickly turn into a $50 an hour job, which is good on an hourly rate. But if you're only shooting for once a week, $1,000 a week as your income in many places in the U.S. at least is, um, is hard to live on, especially in the, the cities. If you're, and if you're out in an urban, uh, in a rural area, you're going to be charging a whole lot less. So, okay. So we know this is if you do one thing. What some of the things you can do to tilt these numbers in your favor, automate your editing. So get really, really good with Photoshop. Learn how to do batch processes um, so that while you're doing your client marketing, while you're checking your statistics, you can say, all right, Photoshop, run these batch scripts on this folder of 600 photos. And while it's doing that in the background, go up, check your analytics, tweak your ad copy, update your, your uh, website, things like that. So basically, you're, you're making your time more efficient by doing two things at once. While you're updating your website, while photos are uploading, respond to a couple texts from clients. Basically, what you're doing here is multitasking with your marketing and editing efforts to try to optimize your time as much as possible. The more you can optimize your time and the more you can juggle multiple moving things at once, the more you can make of the dollars that you earn. And that's going to be the, the goal you need to achieve is how to efficiently spend your time to maximize your income or to maximize the, uh, the way that your income is spread across the time that you have available. You only have a certain number of hours in a day, days in a week, weeks in your life. You get to spend every hour one time. So it's a good idea to make it as efficient as possible. Okay. So... There are some other things you can do. Don't just be a wedding photographer. I used to know a wedding photographer um, back when I lived in California. <coughs> and um, he was, this is early 20 teens. <coughs> and he'd been doing it for 40 years at that point, And he was charging 3,500 bucks per wedding 
which was at that point a pretty good going rate for a really good wedding photographer, which he was. And he was bemoaning the fact that in the early 80s, he was charging 3,500 bucks for a wedding. He had not actually been able to increase the amount that he charged for weddings because digital photography lowered the bar of entry in that industry so much that in order to stay competitive, he couldn't raise his prices, even though he was exceedingly good at it. Uh, so, so he didn't he didn't always care for the fact that in the 80s he could work 20 days a year and make a really really good living but then 40 years later he was working literally every weekend just to break even so um, one thing you can do is don't be a specialist don't just shoot weddings shoot weddings and portraits so you can shoot a wedding two three Saturdays a month and then shoot corporate portraits you're shooting people, right? It's similar practice. Uh, shoot pets. Shoot landscapes and sell your work on, on art websites, things like that. The more diverse you can make your portfolio, the less your income will be affected by changes or by, yeah, by changes in seasonal um, spending. There's a wedding season. There's a corporate portrait season, for instance. Then um, also, the more diverse your portfolio, the more income streams you have, the more stable that your income will be. So let's picture it like this. Let's say that this board, board which is very bent, represents your income. Now, if you are making all of your money on one type of photography and it goes away, your income goes away. But if you're making your money on 10 different types of photography and one of them goes away, it doesn't, I mean, your income might reduce a little bit, but it's not going to completely bottom out. So it's, so the more types of photography you can do, the more insulated you are from fluctuations in income. That's the, the, the point of that. So now that we know how to calculate your hourly rate, based on how much you're making. Now, also imagine that this number is only $500. You're only charging $500 a shoot. That's gonna go down to $25 an hour. What if you're in an area where you're only able to charge $350? It's gonna be like 18 bucks an hour. So in some areas that's fine, but if you're also only working $18 an hour, eight hours a week, that's, that's gonna, be tough to make a living on in many parts of at least the, the US. So diversing, diversifying, working as much as you can, things like that, and then knowing how much time you're spending on everything so that you can then calculate where you're, you're losing money. If you know what you're, what you're spinning your wheels at, you can figure out ways to make that time more efficient or to do that task better and you can, uh, the more you can optimize your time, the better your per hour rate for yourself is going to be. All right, so the next thing let's do is let's talk about selling a widget. Doesn't matter what it is you're gonna sell. It does. You should at least be interested in the thing that you wanna sell. It doesn't have to be cameras. It could be pencils, it could be model trains, it could be homemade paint, I don't know, whatever it is that you are interested in. Let's say that you're, you want to diversify your income or have the majority of your income be from selling a product instead of your services. By and large, if you're gonna sell a product, it's probably gonna be something that's commoditized. Now, what I mean by that is a commodity is something like wheat. You can, if you're a wheat buyer, go to Farmer John and say, hey, how much are you gonna charge me per ton? And you can take that price and you can go down the street to Farmer Joe and say, hey, Farmer Joe, Farmer John will charge me this much. If you make it three cents a ton cheaper, I'll buy it from you. Or you can go into an area and say, I have X number of dollars per ton that I, that I can spend per ton of wheat. Who's willing to sell me their wheat at this number of dollars per ton? Basically, a commodity is something that someone can get from anyone. And the, the other, um, and a lot of, the, the selling things, especially if you think of selling a product as retail, is that you're going into 
what's called a me too industry where a customer says i need a thing and somebody will say i can sell that and someone else will say me too i'll do it for a dollar cheaper so commoditized me too industries which is what i've spent most of my 40 hour a week career on up until the other week um, are a place where it's possible to make a very decent living but you have to know what you're doing you have to know your margins you have to have a good product that you're selling so let's talk about how this cash flow works so what i'm going to show you is an equation based on some magical numbers that um, are not designed to be a, a be-all and end-all equation but a starting point to help you see how quickly income gets eaten up by expenses and how little that will leave you with in terms of profit so let's say that you're selling a widget and you're selling it for a hundred dollars so you've got your hundred dollars per widget that you're selling if you want to make hundred thousand dollars a year you only have to sell a thousand of these that's three a day if they're already made and all you have to do is throw them in a box and ship them out the door that's great and you've got a hundred thousand bucks in your pocket right no unfortunately not okay so if you're gonna sell a widget for a hundred bucks it's gonna cost you some number of dollars to purchase okay so let's say you've got a really high profit item and your widget only costs you fifty dollars per item to purchase I mean that's a good margin that's the kind of margin that retail stores see when they sell furniture actually furniture is a little bit higher than that furniture is about 300 percent margin generally which would mean that if this was furniture you'd probably be buying it for thirty dollars per hundred the other thing that's really high margin at retails retail stores would be coffee if you're at a, at a convenience store for instance or um, plastics so like plastic desk organizers you might buy for twenty dollars when I used to work at an office supply store, they cost us like a buck eighty, something like that. Huge margin. Makes up for all the stuff that we sell for hundred dollars, and it costs us ninety-nine fifty. So at any rate, let's say that you're selling a hundred-dollar item that you've bought for fifty. All right. So immediately, you're down to fifty dollars in gross margin. Okay. And uh, that's still pretty good. Now all you have to do is sell two thousand a year to make hundred grand, right? Because from this 50 that you're going to have, so this is $50 in cost, right? From this 50 that you're gonna have, you're now going to have fees you've gotta pay. All of this assumes that you're just a one person operation, by the way, working out of like a spare bedroom or the corner of your studio apartment, whatever it is. This is really basic stuff that does not cover cost of rent for a brick and mortar location, doesn't cover employees, things like that. So of this $50 now, you're gonna to have to pay some fees. If you're shipping the item, and that purchase price is the total that the customer has paid, you're gonna to have to pay for shipping. That's gonna be dependent on weight and size, but let's say that it costs you about $8 to buy shipping, which is probably reasonable for many single items. Leaves you with 42. Now let's say that uh, you, we still haven't covered everything. You're still going to have to pay fees. If you're selling online and you don't have your own storefront, you're going to have to pay fees to that marketplace. Uh, eBay's fees, for instance, are 9% on the item price, 10% on whatever you charge for shipping, if anything. And then if you accept PayPal, it's 3% of, the, um, uh, of the, the item price. Sorry, 3% of what goes to PayPal plus 50 cents. So if you're talking about a $100 widget that you've sold on eBay, and let's say you charge $100 with free shipping, $9 is gonna to go to eBay, and then 3% of 91 is, let's call that about $3, 250 plus 50 cents, which means you're gonna pay $12-ish in fees to your marketplace. Okay. So now we're down to $30. $30 is not half bad. 
that's a really good net income before expenses uh, rate. In business, there are terms, um, EBITDA is, a, is one, earnings before income, taxes, deductions, and amortization. Way more complicated than anything we're doing here. Uh, when I, when I, th the term I would use for this would be something more like NIBIT, which is net income before taxes. Or um, I think a better, I don't know if there's an actual acronym for net income before taxes and expenses. So off of this $30, you're going to have other expenses. You're going to have to buy a computer, a printer to print your labels and packaging slips, packaging tape. Uh, not expensive, but there's some actual labels, paper to print those, those packaging slips on um, software if you're doing any kind of photo editing for a product page, things like that. So uh, if you're selling a thousand of these and it costs you $5,000 a year in materials, then you're going to be spreading that out over the cost of your thousand items that you sold over the course of the year. And that's another five. Meaning now we're down to 25 an item, okay? So what this means is that at the end of, now this is before taxes still. If you're making $25,000 before taxes, you're gonna have some tax rate. I don't, I, different by country. I actually don't even know what the tax rates are here in the US, but you'll have to pay some amount of taxes on this. So, um, on this number, whatever it is. So if you've sold a thousand, you've made $25,000 off of that. In most of the US, at least, that's a really hard uh, number to live on. I think the poverty line in the US is $38,000 averaged out over the whole country. So you can see here how $100,000 in sales very quickly erodes into a take home of though a very healthy profit margin, not a whole lot. All right, so what happens if you've, you've bought a thousand of these things? Let's say that 10% of them come in and they're not saleable and you can't get your money back. That's a hundred. At 50, that's $5,000 in material losses, right? That would come right off of this number. So material losses, items you buy that you can't resell come straight off of your net. And um, not anything above the line, they come off this bottom line. So there are costs like that which you can't really forecast that just happen over the course of a year. Let's, let's figure out how this, what else this can tell you. What if we change this number? What if this is $70 per item and your gross is only 30%? Well, now these numbers all change. If this goes up 20, this comes down a little bit more than 20. That's going to be around five. What if this is 10? Well, that's a whole lot better. Now your gross is 90%. This number is going to be something more like 35. Uh, I'm sorry, 55. So the other thing you can do is um, reduce shipping cost. If you're shipping if you can cut your shipping cost a thousand uh, one dollar per per unit, then this would become a twenty six. If you can cut your fees by two or three percent, then this goes up. So let's assume you can't raise your prices because you want to be competitive. These numbers in here are the ones that you can start to try to find a way to ad figure out a way to adjust, reduce your purchase cost. Reduce your shipping cost, reduce your fees, things like that. If you're buying items and they come with packaging material, don't throw it out, reuse it. That could help. That could cut this a dollar per item, right? Things like that. And um, so, so this is the, the goal of this is just to help you understand how the money is going to flow if you decide to sell something. And also, how much work you need to do to make a target income. So let's stick with these numbers. And if you've been writing this down, whatever numbers work in, in your formula, uh, you, can, you can adjust these however much you want. Let's say that you actually want to make $100,000 in your pocket at the end of the year, okay? 
If you sell a thousand of these items, you're going to end up with $25,000 before taxes in your pocket. If you want that $100,000 before taxes in your pocket, you've now got to sell 4,000 of these. 4,000 of these spread out over, well, there's six shipping days in a week, but let's say you only want to work Monday through Friday. That's 250 days a year, 50 weeks, assuming two for vacation. 4,000 divided by 250 is eight, four, 16. Is that right? I think it's 16. It's 16, okay. So if you want to sell 4,000 of these in a year, you've got to sell 16 a day every day, on average, over the course of the year to turn this, uh, to, to turn your bottom line number into $100,000 before taxes. So this is another thing you can adjust. You, can, you don't have a ton of control over it, but the more of these that you can sell, the better. What if you're not just selling one widget for $100? What if you have a product line of three widgets that are $100 each? Diversifying your product line, whether you're selling a pencil, a paintbrush, and a desk chair, I don't, I don't know, three different widgets, then um, the better you're going to be at being able to drive revenue. So the point of this is to also say, if you're going to be working as a working photographer, it's a really good idea when we talked about having multiple incomes to support you. Don't just say, I'm going to have 10 different types of photography that I do, because that's 10 different services. And if the market comes out of the service sector, the bottom drops out underneath you. But if you say, I'm going to have five different types of photography and five different products that I sell, let's, because I have 10 fingers. If I had 20 fingers, it would be 10 of each. But, um, and then the market drops out of some of them, then yeah, things will be lower, but you still have some income. So if you're gonna go into photography as a profession, which it's a good profession, and one that can still give you a very good lifestyle, I know the couch doesn't look that great. It's just because it's got a fleece blanket on it. It's really, it's a very nice couch. Um, one that will give you a it, you can have a good lifestyle off of photography, and you can be your own boss, which is super rewarding. You just got to understand where your money comes from. You've got to have a diverse income stream. Ideally, you really want to have a diverse income stream. Unless you're the best in the world at what you do, or one of the best in the world at what you do, and people will seek you out regardless of the economy, it's a good idea to have a diverse income stream. So realistically, the the probability that you will be the best in the world at what you do, very, 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 very slim. Okay. And uh, just have a good understanding of the business side of it so that you can understand how you're making money, how you're losing money. And once you understand those two things, you can, under, you can figure out how to rectify where you're losing money. Margin erosion is the, the term, the, the good term for it. Where is your gross margin being eroded and all of that money being taken out to sea? So um, I hope this was not what you expected. I, I hope that when you saw, we're going to talk about how to make money in photography, that you were expecting me to say, here's all the different things you can do. And I hope that some of these formulas to understand how them, in a very basic sense, how money coming in leads to money in your pocket and money going out. We're helpful in understanding that if you are a photographer and you're making X number of thousand dollars a year, that's not all going into your pocket. The, and the whole point of this is, if you are going to go into a, a job where you are your own boss and you are working directly with clients, the best thing you can do for yourself and your ability to manage your clients and your income well is to have a background in business and a background in customer service so that you can do those aspects of your job very effectively and understand them thoroughly. And that's the best advice I can give you. Understand money, understand customer service, and even if you're not the best photographer in your market, you can still do better for yourself as a business person than many of them can by being 
easy to work with, enjoyable to be around, and just in general, a, a uh, and, and then following through on what you say you're going to be doing, and just in general being reliable. Those are the things that will make you a successful working photographer or working widget salesman, product salesman. And those, those widgets, by the way, could be prints of your own work if you have like a small gallery or something like that or a small online store where you're selling physical prints of the work that you do. So that's, uh, that is today's video. It's, uh, I hope, a good primer, a good survey course level understanding of, of some of this stuff. If there's anything you'd like to talk about on Thursday and Friday, let me know. And uh, otherwise, I'll just keep looking at the news and we'll see what is interesting to talk about in the photography industry this week. Have a good Tuesday, everybody.